Welcome to episode 132 of This Week in Linux, your weekly source for Linux canoes. From the Destination Linux Network, I'm Michael Tunnell. And if you're new to the show, this is the podcast that will keep you up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, and I'll give you my take as a 20-year-plus Linux user. Coming up on this week's episode, we've got some roadmap noobs to talk about related to KDE Plasma Desktop and also their KDE Application Suite. We've also got some news from Ubuntu for improvements related to theming of snaps, and we'll check that out. We've also got some hardware news for a much-anticipated device with the Dragon Box Pyra. If you're not familiar with that, we'll... We'll be sure to stay tuned for that part. Uh, we've also got some distro releases to discuss with Slackle and Scepter Linux. Then in the app news, we'll check out an IP band tool called CrowdSec, a personal health record app, a instant replay tool for Linux, and much more. We've got all that and so much more coming up right now on This Week in Linux. First in the show this week, I want to talk to you about the Destination Linux podcast because we're going live. And if you're watching the live stream of this show, the stream for Destination Linux will be tomorrow. If you're watching the edited version of the show and you're early in the actual watching of it, which is usually released in the morning on Sunday, uh, then you still have a chance to be able to watch the live stream for Destination Linux because on Sunday, January 3rd, which is depending on when you're watching this today or tomorrow. So uh, that'll be happening at 1 p.m. Eastern time or 1800 UTC. So go to dlnlive.com, bookmark that URL, and join us for the first edition of Destination Linux Live in 2021. We'll be doing this going forward every week. So you can just put it on your calendar. And whenever you want to enjoy the awesome shenanigans that happen on Destination Linux, you can do so live with us every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC. I'll see you then. Up next in the show, we're going to talk about the Dragon Box Pyra. So the Dragon Box Pyra is in beginning to ship to people who have pre-ordered it. For those unfamiliar with this device, that's not really surprising because it has been in development for over four years, so it's not really been getting a lot of attention recently. However, it is a very cool idea, and I'm quite interested in all of what it can do and that sort of stuff. So the Dragon Box Pyra is a handheld, hackable, open hardware gaming and computing device. It's usable as a portable gaming machine. Uh, that's actually kind of what it was meant for uh, originally, but they also made it a general purpose computer in addition, so that's really cool. The device is open source hardware, which means that you'll find hardware design files, software, and other resources on their wiki. And let's talk about the specs now. So the Dragon Box Pyra has a five inch, 1280 by 720 pixel LCD display with support for resistive touch input. Now this means that you can use a passive stylus, your fingernail, or even your fingertip, but the screen won't have won't be as sensitive to a finger touch as that capacitive displays that are used in smartphones and that sort of stuff. Uh, some of the computer's hardware looks a little dated, and for a device that won't arrive on your doorsteps until, well, early 2021, particularly... Uh, the processor that they're using, which is an o OMAP 5432 processor from Texas Instruments, which is a dual-core ARM Cortex-A15 chip. And it does have uh, it, it does have some interesting hardware specs, but the CPU is kind of updated a little bit because it was made in 2013. But there are uh, quite a few cool things related to this. And the reason why they picked the processor is because it has good documentation and software support. Uh, it ships with Debian Linux. Now, I would, most people wouldn't consider that a gaming distro. So this promoting it as a, as a gaming distro, I'm not really sure what they're meaning by that. But at the same time, it does support many operating systems. And they haven't really specified which ones support with it. It's just that Debian comes with it by default. Uh, but this, to me, this looks really interesting because it has a keyboard built into it. So you can do all sorts of stuff. And it's just like a very compact device. Uh, it has four gigs of RAM. It has 32 gigs of eMMC storage. It also has a micro SDXC card reader. Uh, and the reason why this is cool is that in addition to just having the extra storage available, the system can be configured to boot from the internal micro SD, uh, SDXC card as well as the eMMC, allowing you to easily run multiple operating systems and even being able to dual boot because you can have use you can have them both to have something installed on both of them and switch whichever one you want to, which is very cool. It all has support for uh, you know eight 
802.11abgn Wi-Fi. It has 4.1 Bluetooth, and there's even optional support for a cellular modem version uh, where you get uh, 3G and 4G wireless networks and even GPS, which is pretty cool. Now, the thing that's really interesting about here is the the hardware itself has a bunch of different buttons and configurations and stuff. Uh, so the, the backlit QWERTY keyboard is really nice to see in such a small compact device. It has dual analog sticks. It has a D-pad, four shoulder buttons like the RB, LB, and RT, and the uh, LT buttons like you find on controller, uh, game controllers. It also has six face buttons that are similar to gaming stuff. It has a user replaceable 6,000 milliamp battery, built-in microphone and stereo speakers, and it also has uh, extra ports for micro HDMI, so you can do HDMI out, which is awesome. Uh, it has a headset jack, which is always nice, and it even has a USB 3.0 with a mi well micro USB uh, OTG type cable for you know data transfer and stuff like that. So very cool. Uh, now this is. It's kind of an expensive device. I'll go ahead and tell you that. It's kind of expensive. It's, it starts at $529 euros with uh, not including VAT. So with VAT, it's about 643 something like that. For those who are not aware, VAT is value-added tax. It's the is what EU calls sales tax. And uh, the, LT, uh, the 4G LTE version starts at 600 or 626 without VAT. And with VAT, it's about 760 These are... Estimates, not exact, just you know, exact numbers, but these are rough estimates on like the pricing structure. Uh, it also, the while the the Dragon Box Pyra handhelds are being shipped with pre, for pre orders, and they are taking new pre orders, which is cool. There's no clear ETA right now for when it will happen with the new pre orders. They say it may take up to six months. And now this makes sense because the team behind the Dragon Box Pyra is a very small team. And this is a very unique and specific type of device. It has a lot of cool stuff going for it, and, but it, it also took a lot of like um, you know development time to figure out how to make it all work and what and what like parts to make it work and things like that. So it does make sense. And while this certainly isn't the most powerful handheld gaming device on the market, I think it's a very interesting device and might be a great portable computing device for people who want to have a lot of features in a very compact form factor. And if you'd like to learn more about the Dragon Box Pyra, then you'll find links in the show notes. And also before we move on, I often say links in the show notes, and I just wanted to clarify that what that means. I'm referring to the page on the website linked in the description, not the video description itself. So the show notes is on the website, not the description. You know, just to clear that up. Anyway, if you want to ch check out more about the Dragon Box Pyra, then check out the links in the show notes. So universal formats are very popular these days for distributing software to users, and they should be really. Uh, however, all three of the big players in the universal format space suffer from some sort of shortcomings. Uh, one of the issues that Snaps have had most of its life is, well, unpleasant theming. Not always, because sometimes snaps can look great depending on the application and that sort of stuff, but also sometimes they look like they're from 1995. Uh, Ubuntu have been working on this issue for a while and have made a lot of progress here, which is much appreciated by many. And recently on their blog, they posted a, a, a blog post called uh, or entitled Snaps and Themes on the Path to Seamless Desktop Integration. So that is something I would certainly had to check out. And just to, to quote from the blog post, they say that alongside performance, theming is one of the primary concerns for desktop Snap users. People expect applications bundled inside Snaps to look and behave just like their counterparts shipped and packaged in the traditional way in their Linux distributions. And any discrepancy in this space can lead to a degraded user experience. Now, I agree with this. It does kind of throw you off when it looks uh, not accurate to what the system looks like, but it's not necessarily that the themes or the applications don't look like inter seamlessly integrated. It's more like they look like they're stuck in a, a time vortex of 1995. If the theme wasn't so bad, <laughs> it wouldn't be as much of an issue. It would, st it would be kind of irritating, but it wouldn't be like, wow. That's a problem. Uh, so I'm glad to see that they're addressing that problem, but it's a, it's a slightly different problem than what they're talking about in that particular uh, quote. But anyway, so one of the things that they're doing for this uh, 
desktop integration for the snaps is that they set up this automatic theme installation for snaps. So when you install and apply a new theme in your system, the change will propagate to your snaps. It's done by a background service and it checks if the theme already exists as a snap. And if not, it off offers the option to install it. And then this is also applied for if the theme doesn't even have a snap. So there does need to be a snap for the particular theme as well as the icon themes and that sort of stuff. And if it if you don't have the snap for the theme installed, it will offer to install it. But if it doesn't exist at all, well, that's actually not something that it will be able to automatically set up for you. But uh, it will give you the option to uh, they have they have provided documentation for people who make make themes in order to make snaps, which is very nice. And by default, you'll have access to a range of the common themes that are available. So if you use any of the standard or stock themes that are distributed from different desktop environments and that sort of stuff, then you will have pretty good integration just out of the box. So that's very cool. And uh, for those who are developers of themes and icon themes and that sort of stuff, I think if you, it would be really great if you were to make snaps for those because it would make it a lot better for the user experience. And uh, that'd be great. So... Consider that if you're a theme designer and icon designer, uh, that'd be awesome. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about this uh, particular news, I'll have a link to the blog post in the show notes below. KDE made a lot of progress in 2020, and they don't seem to be slowing down, which is great. Uh, KDE's Nate Graham shared a preview of the KDE roadmap for 2021, and I gotta say, I'm excited. I know it's not surprising to most of you that I'm looking forward to each KDE Plasma release, but 2021 looks like it's going to be a big year for KDE. So the, on, on their roadmap, they listed off a few things, and I'm just going to cover like the highlights. But first of all, they say they're going to uh, potentially have production-ready Plasma Wayland session, which is very cool. Uh, Nate Graham, on his blog post, I'll give a quote real quick. He says that, I'll be honest, before 2020, the Plasma Wayland session felt like a mess to me. Nothing worked properly. But all of this changed in 2020. Suddenly, things started working properly. I expect the trend of serious concentrated Wayland work to continue in 2021. That is awesome to hear. Uh, having uh, Plasma Wayland support is going to be very good for the the progress of Wayland because having uh, GNOME and KDE Plasma, have the two big DEs pushing support for Wayland will be very good for Wayland itself. Also, uh, there's they talk about in the next few versions of KDE Plasma, they're going to be doing fingerprint support throughout the entire stack, which is very, very cool. A lot of people have been wanting that functionality for a while. I don't have anything that has a fingerprint testing thing, but uh, it's really cool for the people who do have that and want to use that support that they're working on that. So it'll be working for uh, login screens, the lock screens, uh, K-Auth, uh, policy kit, that sort of stuff. Very cool. And they've actually already been working on the uh, plumbing, as it were, that was required for supporting it. And that's that's currently underway. So that's really cool. And also they're going to do doing work on the next evolution of the Breeze theme. So the Breeze theme is the default theme for Plasma. It's a theme that they've had for a very long time. And they're going to be, actually it's been since 2014 roughly, is when they've had that theme. And they're working on improving it and m modernizing it even more than it already is. They, uh, Nate says in the blog post that work, this work is in progress and about half of it has already been merged to be released in Plasma 5.21 and that he also expects the rest to be, will land in Plasma 5.22 or maybe in 5.23 later in the year. So this is great news because as a fan of Plasma, I've always liked Breeze. In fact, Breeze is what made me even willing to try Plasma many years ago when they replaced Oxygen with Breeze. Uh, I am very glad to see the modernization of Breeze continuing and the stuff they have listed in the next evolution of Breeze looks quite good. So I'm excited to see what they're going to do next. And in fact, one of the things that I'm excited to see is that they're being replacing Kickoff with a new app menu. And it's a, it is a much appreciated improvement because, well, Kickoff is not necessarily, I don't have a problem with Kickoff. It just felt a bit cumbersome. So I always replaced it with something simpler. And this new app menu that I'm displaying in the video version, this this new app menu looks like it'll be a nice balance of simple yet powerful. So I am very excited about that. So in summary, KDE Dev want to create a mainstream hardware ready software stack. And I'm excited for this effort. In fact, I even submitted some code of my own to the, the next versions of KDE Plasma. Uh, admittedly, not the most game-changing code, but I, you know, I know. I'm, 
it does feel nice to have contributed some code, even if it's not game changing. So uh, members of the KD community have attempted in the past to give me that experience. And so, well, I guess you won that round KDE. <laughs> anyway, so that's a look at KDE's roadmap for 2021. And I think it's safe to say that KDE's future looks cool and breezy. If you'd like to learn more about this, check you can check the links in the show notes below. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean and their app platform. DigitalOcean's app platform serves as a solution to build modern cloud-native apps. Use a simple, intuitive, and visually rich experience to rapidly build, deploy, manage, and scale apps. It has support for multiple programming languages like Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby. It even supports static sites and Docker. It also has high scalability and zero infrastructure management. What exactly does that mean? Well, you simply point your GitHub repository to the app platform and let it do all the heavy lifting for you. It handles the infrastructure like app runtimes and dependencies so that you can push code to the production in just a few clicks. It also has the ability to secure your apps automatically because they create, manage, and renew your SSL certificates and also protect your apps from DDoS attacks. You can run code with little to no customization. App platform uses open cloud native standards and automatically analyzes your code, creates containers, and runs them on Kubernetes clusters. And as a listener of This Week in Linux podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started with DigitalOcean's new app platform service for free, actually better than free, because you can get a $100 free credit when you go to do.co slash DLN. Again, go to do.co slash DLN to get started with your $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's new app platform service. And we want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Linux. Have you ever wanted to try out Slackware? but you know, wish there was an easier way to get started with Slackware. Uh, there have been many Slackware-based distributions over the years to try out, and even in the early days of the SUSE project, uh, opens, or not OpenSUSE, but in the early day of SUSE, they used Slackware as the base, but most of those have gone away or changed bases or, in SUSE's case, created their own base. Uh, there are still a few that are around, and we may cover some of them in the future, but one caught my attention that I wanted to talk about because it seems to have revive some parts of another in a way. Uh, Slackle is what I'm referring to. So Slackle is based on Slackware Current. And in addition to that, Slackle uses uh, Salix tools from the Salix distro. Salix has been dormant for a few years now. So this is rather interesting to me because it uses some Salix tools in order to make Slackle work the way they wanted it to. So Slackle's latest release was released on January 1st of 2021 and uses OpenBox as the default UI. They also have additions for KDE Plasma and Mate, which are expected to be released relatively soon. Uh, it uses the Linux 5.10 uh, LTS kernel series. It comes with all the latest updates from Slackware's current tree. And also it has their own live installer, the Slackle live installer or L SLI. Uh, and this is really interesting because the it allows you this new the new version of this installer has support for uh, real installation to an external USB stick or USB SSD or even a USB hard disk. And this means you don't have to do a persistence mechanism, but instead have a full install on a portable thumb drive, which is rather intriguing, I gotta say. And if you'd like to learn more about this particular distro or the latest release of this distro, then check out the links in the show notes below. Up next in the show is CrowdSec. CrowdSec is an open source lightweight agent to detect and respond to bad behaviors on a server. It's also automatically benefits from a global community-wide IP reputation database. So what does all this mean? Well, it's a modern detection system written in Go, and for those familiar, it could be described as like a next generation of fail to ban. If you want more in-depth take on CrowdSec, be sure to check out episode 14 of the Pseudo Show on the Destination Linux Network, where they interview the CEO of CrowdSec. But for now, uh, the way they describe it is that they say that it stacks on fail to bans philosophy, but uses grok patterns and YAML grammar to analyze logs, and also have a modern uh, decoupled approach for cloud containers, VM-based infrastructures. So once detected, you can re re remedy threats from various bouncers uh, for you know blocking things, uh, sending out for 403 messages, captures that sort of stuff, and the blocked IPs are shared among all users to further the improve their security. Uh, so they also say that it's you know it's the, one of the things that's really interesting about CrowdSec is that it's meant to be an easier to use lower uh, technical barrier of entry with a higher security gain. So it has a user-friendly design. It's more modernized overall. And it's really interesting because fail to ban 
is a lot to get started with, and CrowdSec seems to be kind of like a new evolution of that sort of structure, which is really cool, especially with the the way they do the uh, sharing of the uh, continuously distributed across the various different CrowdSec clients so that the community can share information about something like once something's being detected and blocked and has been verified across the network, then they will uh, share that around like all the other clients basically reinforcing each pers- each usage of the servers at- on that software because you know it's basically CrowdSec meaning crowd security, which is really cool. So it reads and normalizes data sources, matches them to behavior patterns, uh, and then on detection of wanted unwanted behavior like you know sort of basically being attacked on a server, it deals with it through a bouncer and does different things based on the kind of actions they were doing. It's really interesting. And if you want to dig into this topic a bit more, you'll certainly want to check out the links in the show notes and particularly the link to the episode 14 of Pseudo Show, uh, where they interview the CEO of CrowdSec. It was very interesting. Uh, It's a very interesting discussion, so be sure to check that out. And also, if you're interested in enterprise open source, then be sure to subscribe to the Pseudo Show podcast on the Destination Linux Network. Up next in the show is an app that I just recently heard about. It's based on a project that I just recently heard about, and it's about like a personal health record app. So it's called My GNU Health. It is a desktop and mobile application that can help you take control of your health for like personal health record. It allows you to access and record and take action based on the data for your health. Uh, it also allows you to connect to uh, health professionals and that sort of stuff to stay on top of uh, any kind of health issues that you may or may not have. Uh, it's really interesting. It's made by the KDE team. It recently became part of the KDE project, uh, and the My GNU Health is based on the GNU Health Dot org project, which we'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. But this application allows you to uh, have a password protection based on your uh, for your data. It doesn't necessarily mention encryption, whether that's not av- that's available or not. I'm not sure. But it has options for different sections for uh, bio section for like vital signs and other clinical information history. It has stuff on like personal health diary. Uh, it also has a, a section called book of life. And uh, it basically it says a uh, quote from the section on the page. It says uh, from the genetic and molecular component molecular components to the social events throughout your life to make a unique individual. You can keep track of all of this stuff, which is pretty interesting. It also has the op- ability to add files for like into like a personal database for stuff related to like documents and that kind of thing, as well as has a mer- emergency contact thing that allow- I'm not really sure how this will work, but it allows you to have a an emergency contact number that the application can call if there's an issue. Uh, but it's pretty interesting. It's uh, open source software. It's uh, released under the GPL v3. Uh, and for those who are not familiar with GNU Health, this project is, they say, is a Libra community-driven project from uh, GNU Solidario. That's fun to say. A uh, nonprofit humanitarian organization focused in, on social medicine. Uh, they say that their project has been adopted by multilateral organizations to national public health systems around the world. And that's very interesting. I'm surprised I haven't heard of this, but I hadn't until recently. So that's pretty cool. If you want to learn more about this particular project or this particular application, I'll have links to both of those in the show notes below. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. Bitwarden is a password manager, and password manager is a software that allows you to keep peace, get peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. How does it do that? Well, securing your online accounts is very important because best security practices for passwords is to have a different password for every account on every website that you sign up to. And sure, that makes sense as a policy, but without a password manager, that's also a very painful thing to do. And that's where Bitwarden comes in. So Bitwarden solves this by providing tools to store all of your passwords in a secured vault, auto-generate those passwords for you, and even automatically fill in those passwords on login forms so you don't have to do that, which is very nice. And you can access your data across many different types of devices like your web browser, using your mobile devices, uh, also desktop application, and even the command line. Uh, Bitwarden seals your your private data with end-to-end encryption before it ever leaves your devices so you know that you're the only person with access to your data. Bitwarden is the password manager that I use and trust because in addition to all of these great features, it also has 100% 
open source software. So that's right, 100% open source. So that means that the features and security of their infrastructure can be vetted and improved by the community. And they don't just stop there at just open sourcing. And they also bring in third party security firms to audit their code to make sure it is secure as possible. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. And did I mention that you can get started for free? Well, you can, but I think you'll want to do more than that. I think you want to check out the premium account because you get a bunch of extra stuff like one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with UBQ, YubiKey, U2F, Duo, uh, Vault Health Reports. You also get priority customer service and Bitwarden Authenticator app for temporary one-time passwords. And you get all of this for, for less than a dollar per month. That's right, less than a dollar per month. Make the smart move like many from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN. This lets you get peace of mind for your password and other sensitive data while also supporting a company that truly gets open source. Sign up for their $10 per year or less than a dollar a month premium account and you, you'll to let them know that you appreciate them supporting open source and supporting the This Week in Linux podcast. So go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. And thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring This Week in Linux. So let's talk about Scepter Linux. Scepter Linux is a Debian-based distribution that is built to be an anonymous OS, similar to how Tails works, the Tails distribution. Now, to be clear, the website for Scepter Linux is written in Serbian, so I have basically no idea what most of it says, and translation tools can only do so much. Uh, I was able to decipher from blindly assuming the translation tools are accurate that it is designed for security and anonymous browsing. Based on Debian's testing branch, which will eventually become Debian 11 Bullseye, they have the Linux kernel 5.9.15. They are using the KDE Plasma 5.20.4. It has a Tor browser installed by default. It also has most of the applications pre-configured to automatically connect to the internet via Tor, so that's interesting. It has Onion Share for anonymous file sharing, QTalks for an anonymous instant messaging. It also has the GUFW uh, firewall. It has a, a block device encryption software called ZuluCrypt. And also it has some like sweeper history and temporary file cleaner software and that sort of stuff. Uh, it is worth noting that kernel 5.9 is end of life. It reached end of life in mid-December of last year or 2020. 2020. So uh, it no longer will receive updates in terms of the kernel team. So unless the Debian project is doing updates or Scepter Linux themselves are doing updates, it is kind of interesting that they're using the 5.9. Uh, hopefully they'll be updating soon to the newer LTS version of 5.10, but we'll see. Uh, this is an interesting distribution. I don't know. I'm not really like re recommending it because I because uh, again I couldn't read what most of what they were saying on their website is. But if you want to check it out, I think this is uh, you know interesting to see that there are other uh, options in the anonymous OS space. So if you would like to check out Scepter Linux, I'll have links to it in the show notes below. Up next in the show is an, a Linux instant replay tool called Replay Sorcery. So Replay Sorcery is a bit like AMD Relive or NVIDIA Shadowplay Instant Replay. These are both Windows apps, and they allow you to have a quick snapshot of a uh, what you're doing in a game and create a video based on it. So uh, the developer of this, uh, Joshua Minter, says that back when I used Windows, I used AMD Relive a lot, and he says that uh, it and the NVIDIA version Shadowplay Instant Replay will constantly record the screen without using too much computer resources, and at the press of a, a key combo, it will save the last 30 seconds. He says that he wanted this to have something like this for Linux and was tired of waiting for someone else to do it, so he created Replay Sorcery, which is fantastic. That's a great reason to make something, and I also appreciate that you didn't want to wait anymore and decided to make it yourself because now it exists and thank you very much. That's very cool. So this is a short capture solution. And what exactly does this mean? Well, it stores around 30 seconds of the screen and audio output in memory, which can then be dumped into a video file on your computer. This effectively lets you create a replay file, or in other words, it's kind of like making a local video similar to clips function on Twitch. In the latest release, they have several new features. They have audio capture, options for changing output quality, uh, local config file support, the ability to not run as root anymore, which is great. Also, it has support for hardware acceleration through the VA API. Uh, they say that they have on their to-do list, they are going to be trying to support uh, in the future NVENC API, which is actually kind of cool because it means that they have AMD hardware acceleration before they had NVIDIA, which is always nice to see because typically it's the reverse but I'm really happy to see that they did that instead. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but since I have AMD, that's why I like seeing it. <laughs> but anyway, 
So there is something worth noting. It's really cool uh, that this exists. I'm glad that replay sorcery is a thing. So thank you for making it. But it is worth noting that uh, the availability for it isn't that well, well rounded, I guess. It's only available as a package in the AUR uh, made by a community member in the AUR and also from building it from source from their GitHub. So maybe in the future, they'll be making packages for it for different distributions, or maybe some distributions will like to package it themselves in their repos. But right now it's basically the AUR or compile it yourself from source. So really cool. Hopefully it gets more fleshed out and more, you know, spread around different distros because I think it'd be really awesome as a feature for a tool for people to want to use. Uh, I, I know I want to use it. So hopefully it does get pushed out a lot more. If you'd like to learn more inform information about this tool, then check out the links in the show notes below. Up next in the show is Xenotic, because I want to talk about Xenotic because they are having their 10-year uh, anniversary of the game, which is awesome. If you're not familiar, Xenotic is a free and fast-paced first-person shooter, and they've recently celebrated 10 years of their game. So it's a very fun game. It's often featured in our DLN Game Fest. It's a great multiplayer game, so that you, it's, a it's always fun to have you know, time hanging out with people in the DLN community. And also while I get constantly fragged because I'm not good of a shot for a first person shooter, but it is fun to do it nonetheless. So uh, to quote their website, the way they describe it is Xenotic is an addictive arena style first person shooter with crisp movement and wide array of weapons. It combines intuitive mechanics with an in your face action to elevate your heart rate. It definitely does that quite well. A Xenotic is and always will be free to play and it's available under the GPL V3 license. So it's open source. Uh, and I just want to say I'm very happy Happy, uh, uh, you know, I'm very happy that this project exists, and I also want to wish you all a happy 10th anniversary for the project and to the Xenotic team. And thank you so much for making this game because it is a really fun game, and I'm really impressed like that you've kept it going for as long as you have. It's very rare for a game to last that long in general, and for an open source game to do it while also reinventing itself along the way, really cool. And I also got to say that the Zon stats, I think that's how you're supposed to say it is a very cool thing. So Zonstats are an integrated player statistics system that lets you track your progress and see stats like your kill-death ratio, your weapon damage, your accuracy, or in my case, lack thereof. And it also is really cool because the tracking is completely opt-in and there's no login required. So very cool. Uh, and if you'd like to try out Xenotic for yourself, then you can, li you can uh, likely install it from your distro repository. It might be out of date in your repos though, but uh, if it is, then just go to their website and you'll, you'll be able to download the link right there and just use the SDL version of the game and it'll be it'll just launch right there. It's really nice. I actually prefer the SDL version, just downloading the tarball and you know you download the tarball, extract it, uh, double click the SDL version and it runs just great. That's what I typically like to do. So you know you might want to consider that depending on your version of your distro. Uh, there's also a snap for it, which is kind of cool. Uh, but anyway. Xenotic is a really cool first-person shooter that if you haven't checked out, you definitely need to. I'll have links to it in the show notes below if you'd like to check it out. Also, if you're listening in the audio version, Xenotic is spelled with an X, not a Z. So if you want to search for it at that point, there you go. Up next in the show is FrontPageLinux.com. So what is FrontPage Linux? Well, FPL is a website with news, articles, tutorials, opinions, and so much more focused on Linux and open source. And all of the content at FrontPageLinux.com is just fantastic. But what makes it really cool, what makes FrontPage Linux the, the coolest thing about it is that you, yes, you listening to the show uh, can write for front page Linux. If you'd like to do the, what deep Graywall did, he wrote an article for ButterFS, like a getting started guy for ButterFS. He also wrote a great article for a tutorial for Restic backups, really cool articles. Check those out. I have links in the, in the video description and also in the show notes. And if you want to do what he did and write and become a contributor for FPL, then here's what you need to do. Go to frontpagelinux.com and click on the the contribute link at the top of the page. This is where you'll it'll take you to an, another page that explains the process of becoming a contributor and submitting content to Front Page Linux. Anyone is welcome to contribute to FPL, so if you're interested, then please get in touch. We are currently looking for people interested in doing news stories, tutorials, opinion pieces, and pretty much anything else. Uh, if this sounds like something you'd like to do, then go to frontpagelinux.com to learn more. 
Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the show and the channel, then we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, sponsors, and many more. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to dlnstore.com. You can find stuff like the Linux Everywhere t-shirt. You can find the This Week in Linux shirt that I'm wearing right now in the video version of the show. And also so much more, including some new stuff, even hats that are coming very soon. So check that out, dlnstore.com. And we also have ways to contribute with any cost to you by using our affiliate links. You can find links for places like Amazon, Humble Bundle, and many more by going to tuxdigital.com slash affiliates. Or if you'd like, you can you can check out some more pod podcasting goodness from me by going to the Destination Linux Network and checking out the other podcasts that I'm a part of, like the Destination Linux Podcast and Hardware Addicts, as I'm a co-host of both of those shows. And just a reminder, this show is live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time or 1800 UTC, so join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each week. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tanell with the Destination Linux Network, and as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux, and I'll see you next week for another episode of your weekly source for Linux good news.